Welcome to the Sisterhood of Sweat. Our guest today is Dr. Ross Pelton. Ross Pelton is a pharmacist and has a PhD in psychology. He is also a certified clinical nutritionist, a health educator, and the author of 11 books on a variety of health topics. In October 1999, Ross was named one of the top 50 most influential pharmacists in America by American Druggist Magazine for his work in natural medicine. Ross is currently the scientific director for Essential Formulas, which is a company that specializes in research and marketing of premium probiotic products. Today was such a treat to have Dr. Ross on the podcast. This is his third episode with us. So if you enjoyed it and you want to go back to prior episodes, we'll, we'll list them in the show notes along with all of his freebies. He gave quite a few of them. Uh, if you want to go back and check out the information and the guides that he offers. Today we talked about microbiome what it is, why it's important, and how to create a good environment for our microbiome in the gut. We talked about postbiotic metabolites and the new science behind all of that. And he explained why they're really super important for our probiotics to work. So you got to create a good environment for your probiotics. You can't just throw them in the gut and think, oh, that's the solution. So that was pretty interesting. He went over a lot of studies. So make sure you tune in today because um, I, I just, if you like science and you like to understand why and how the body works and how to maintain your youth, you're really going to enjoy listening to Dr. Ross today. He also talked about antibiotics and why we would want to be taking more probiotics when we're using antibiotics. Gut dysbiosis, I don't think I said that right. <laughs> so don't call me out on it. <laughs> I am not a doctor, okay? And then we also talked about neurotransmitters and how you know the second brain how the gut is the second brain and how uh you know having good probiotics helps to increase the serotonin and all of the feel good hormones in the gut and what a complete microbiome system is and what it includes so many things today well without further ado let's dive into this episode with the one and the only Dr. Ross Pelton. Hey, everybody. I am so excited to have Dr. Ross Pelton back on the podcast today. How are you? Hi, Linda. Nice to be back with you and all your viewing audience. Uh, yes, you, you are very well listened to. My listeners love to get information and knowledge on how to take better care of their health. No, you're a health warrior, and I appreciate everything you do to help get this information out to people. Well, thank you. It comes from a long line of parents and grandparents all really appreciating their health, and especially my father appreciated taking care of his health because my grandmother, his mother, was not in perfect health from 17 to 71. So mm -hmm. he got to see the other side of it. So he was always all about greens and, you know, oh my gosh. Well, you're um, really fortunate in that way because most people have had not had good mentors and good teachers when it comes to health, myself included. And so that's why I've kind of devoted my professional career to helping to educate people about some of the really critical health topics that people need to know and learn about. And I love that so much. How did you become the natural pharmacist, where did you get started? Um, I was, for uh, several decades, I was pretty much a standard American guy, pharmacist, fast food meals, and, but in 1980, I got introduced to yoga. 
And through yoga, I met people who were interested in health. They ate healthy foods, they exercised regularly, and they read health newsletters and health magazines and health books. And I started to just absorb that information like a sponge. And it all just makes sense. And it's been making sense ever since. So I've since 1980, I've been continually and increasingly passionate and sometimes neurotically following the path of health. And uh, I learn about it and I teach it and share it with people. And, and I eventually started my natural pharmacist uh, website and blog. And um, I'm just having my 11th book published now. So it just keeps rolling along. I love that you switched from regular pharmacy to the natural. Uh, yeah, I, and I now call I, myself the re a recovering pharmacist. I have that conversation with a lot of clients. I've had a lot of pharmacists over time and also pharmaceutical reps. And I would always have a conversation about, you know, selling drugs that have worse side yeah. effects than the actual disease. And, you know, that's a conversation for another show, but I'm just saying like, it, when, we, when we can get in touch at the root cause and take things for our health to better ourselves and get to the root cause of things, it's always better than having to take something that maybe the side effect is death. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Natural therapy should be the first line of approach to any health problem. And of course, I'm the author of the Drug-Induced Nutrient Depletion Handbook. So I teach people about the side effects from all the drugs and the, the nutritional depletions from all the drugs they're taking. So that's a big part of my career. Well, I'm happy to say I'm drug-free and I'm going to be 58 next week. Fabulous. You're looking great. Keep it up. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying like taking care of your health has, has many benefits. And um, I really want to dive into the topic that is really at hand right now with everything that's going on in the world with this pandemic, our immune systems and how important our microbiome is to having a good immune system. That's the topic and I'm happy to share information with people about it. And um, one thing we'll start out with, I wrote an article titled Postbiotic Metabolites, The New Frontier in Microbiome Science. And people can get that article by just doing a Google search for Townsend, T-O-W-N-S-E-N-D, my name, Pelton, P-E-L-T-O-N, and glutathione. And, um, and excuse me, I'm, I misspoke there, uh, postbiotics. is Townsend, Pelton, postbiotics. And that article will come up and they can download it or copy it. But um, it explains to people, and I'm teaching pro healthcare professionals as well as the, the general public, that it's not the bacteria that are so important. It's the compounds that the bacteria produce, which are called postbiotic metabolites. And now there's an increasing understanding that these compounds that the bacteria produce are master health regulating compounds for the entire body. They don't just work in the gastrointestinal system. They regulate every single organ system, especially the brain and the immune system. So that's the new frontier in microbiome science, learning that when the bacteria ferment and digest fibers, they create these secondary compounds that have a wide range of ways that they regulate your biochemistry and your physiology. And so um, just some examples. Um, there's compounds called short chain fatty acids. They're slightly acidic, short chain fatty acids. And these compounds regulate the acid base balance in the intestinal tract. So it's the optimal acid base balance to promote the growth of good bacteria and suppress the growth of bad bacteria. There's other compounds called antimicrobial peptides. These are natural antibiotics that are produced by the probiotic bacteria that kill pathogens in your digestive tract. And there's just a wide range of different types of compounds and different ways that these postbiotic metabolites support your immune system. They have, some of them have antiviral properties and immune system enhancing properties, and they regulate the, um, the metabolism of the cells that are called the colonocytes, the cells that line your gastrointestinal tract. Um, so this is really a, a new message. And the key to understanding this message is your microbiome is more than just probiotic bacteria. There's two pieces to the puzzle. 
It's your probiotic bacteria and dietary fiber. Fiber is the food for your probiotic bacteria. And if you don't learn how to feed your probiotic bacteria well, they won't thrive and survive. And so there's millions and millions of people that are taking probiotics, but they're not consuming a high fiber diet. So they're getting very little benefit from their probiotics. One of the studies I report in my presentations said that 90% of American children and adults do not consume the recommended daily allowance of fiber. So we've got to start recognizing how important fruits and vegetables and whole grains and seeds and nuts are to get the fiber. And the other key to this is it's not just the quantity of fiber it's missing. It has to be a diversity of fiber because different types of fiber support the growth of different types of bacteria. And that's the way you get a diverse microbiome. And there's lots of studies that report that better health is associated with a more diverse microbiome. And that means more different strains of bacteria. And so the only way you can do this is to consume a very diverse range of fibers. And so there's two additional points I'll talk about. One is the myth of high dose probiotics. People always think more is better. So mine's got 30 billion, mine's got 50 billion, mine's got 100 billion. When you take probiotics that have high numbers of one or just several strains, you're really working against balance and diversity. Those are critical factors for a healthy microbiome. So it's better to take a wide range or what we call multi-strain probiotics that have more different strains, but not such high numbers. But then you also have to have a diversity of fiber. And um, I'm the scientific, full disclosure here, I'm the scientific director at Essential Formulas based in Dallas. And we market a, a product called Dr. O'Hara's Probiotics. And Dr. O'Hara's is different than every other probiotic in the world because it's made completely differently. There's a huge ultra sterile warehouse with 80 gallon fermentation vats. And we start out with dozens of different types of organically grown foods that are shredded and added to the fermentation vats. These are Japanese fruits, vegetables, mushrooms, seaweeds. Those are the high fiber foods for the bacteria. And then we start with 12 strains of bacteria and the bacteria get to digest and ferment those fibers for three to five years before the product is encapsulated. So there's an original formula that's a three year fermentation product that's sold at the retail level at health food stores and vitamin stores around the United States. The professional formula is a five-year fermentation process, and that's only sold through healthcare professionals. But during the multi-year fermentation process, the bacteria are breaking down the fibers and creating these postbiotic metabolites. So there's independent research now that documents that Dr. O'Hara's probiotics contains over 500 of these postbiotic metabolites. And the difference in how Dr. O'Hara's functions and how fast it works for people, we com I compare commercial probiotics that just contain bacteria. When you take a commercial product that just contains bacteria, those bacteria have to survive the transit through the harsh acid environment in the stomach. And if they survive, then when they reach the small intestine, they have to find fibers and start the process of converting those fibers into these postbiotic metabolites. That all takes time. And a lot of people when they're sick and they don't feel good and they've got dysbiosis and gas and bloating and diarrhea and constipation and so forth, they don't eat well, they don't feel like eating. When you take Dr. Here's, you directly deliver these postbiotic metabolites. So they immediately go to work with anti-inflammatory activity and antimicrobial peptides. So anti-inflammatory. Yeah, so it's really, really a fast way to solve digestive complaints related to dysbiosis. Um, so it's a, a real breakthrough in the probiotic product or the category. Um, and Dr. O'Hara's probiotics is really less a probiotic and more a fermented food probiotic that directly delivers these postbiotic metabolites. So that's a, really a revolutionary story and a revolutionary story in, in understanding how your microbiome works. Because for decades, we've known that probiotic bacteria benefit our health, but we haven't known the mechanism of action. Now we're starting to understand that it's the bacteria fermenting the fibers in the colon, creating these secondary compounds, the postbiotic metabolites, and those are the health-regulating compounds. 
Well, you're making me want to reach for my probiotics right now. You know, after you listen to a really good health podcast, you, you, you do all the things. That's why it's so important to listen to experts like you, Dr. Ross. Yeah. And for my listeners out there that may not understand what we're talking about, let's dive back a little bit. Can you explain to them what microbiome is and why, why it's so yeah. important? So the microbiome is the term we use to relate to the 100 trillion bacteria that inhabit your gastrointestinal system. But I like to kind of enlarge the definition and make people realize that it's not just the bacteria. We have to consider the whole microbiome ecosystem. And that's the bacteria plus the postbiotic metabolites that they create. And an example that I use is that I show in my slides a picture of the Amazon rainforest. I do a comparison between two of the most important ecosystems in the world, the Amazon rainforest and your gastrointestinal microbiome. And I show slides of the Amazon rainforest and all the birds and reptiles and um, different species, mammals, different species and plants and trees and so forth. And then I show a picture of clear cutting the Amazon rainforest with all the trees cut down and everything. And the point I make is that if you wanna repair that Amazon ecosystem, it's not enough to just put the inhabitants back in. If you put the bees and the birds and the butterflies and the monkeys and the snakes and everything back into a destroyed rainforest with all the trees cut down, they're not gonna survive. And in the analogy in your microbiome, when you have dysbiosis and everything's upset, it's not enough to just put the bacteria in. You've got to change the whole ecosystem. And that's what these postbiotic metabolites do. So Dr. Harris directly delivers these postbiotic metabolites, which rebalances the acid base level, directly kills pathogens, reduces the inflammation, stimulates vastly the regrowth of healthy new cells that lie in the gastrointestinal tract. And I've got a slide that shows a highly inflamed gastrointestinal tract. It's really ugly. Oh and when gosh. you have dysbiosis and that high level of inflammation in the lining of your gastrointestinal tract, you wanna really quickly rebuild healthy new cells there. And a lot of people don't realize that the cells that line your gastrointestinal tract have the highest rate of turnover of any cells in the body. You make an entire new lining to your gastrointestinal tract every four to six days. So you're renewing your gastrointestinal tract every four to six days, but it takes fiber to allow the bacteria to create these postmyotic metabolites that will do that. And, um, and that's what regulates your digestion and your absorption, and your immune system and so many different things. So rebuilding a healthy gastrointestinal tract is really paramount. And one of the short chain fatty acids that's produced by probiotic bacteria is called butyrate. And butyrate is the number one primary fuel for your colonocytes. And those are the cells that lie in your colon in your gastrointestinal tract. And remember, they're turning over every four to six days. It takes an enormous amount of energy to rebuild your gastrointestinal tract every four to six days, and you don't get that energy from the food you eat. You get that energy from the postbiotic metabolite that's created by the probiotic bacteria that make the butyrate. So scientists, now there's studies, I've got the references on this, about 10% of your daily energy requirement comes from the butyrate that supplies the energy to renew the cells in the lining of your gastrointestinal tract. So that's one of the reasons why it's so critically important to be supplying fiber so the bacteria can make these postbiotic metabolites or take Dr. O'Hara so you can directly deliver them to your gastrointestinal system. And butyrate also has antiviral activity. It helps to recognize some of the DNA in viruses and then selectively kill them. So right now we've got a pandemic going on. Everybody's concerned about their immune system and viral situation. Some of the postbiotic metabolites have very significant antiviral activity. So that's just another part of your immune system that's regulated by your probiotic bacteria and your microbiome. Wow, this is fascinating stuff. Now let, let's back up a little bit. What, yeah. how, where should we get our short chain fatty acids that you were talking about that are important? Sure, you get them from having a healthy 
microbiome so that the bacteria in your microbiome can digest the fibers to produce the short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids are just one category of postbiotic metabolites. And there's a book titled The Mind Gut Connection, authored by Dr. Emron Mayer. He's a highly respected, he's an MD and one highly respected scientist in the microbiome community. And in his book, he says that your bacteria will use the information in their millions of genes to digest and ferment your food and create hundreds of thousands of metabolites. So we're just on the cutting edge of starting to understand all these compounds that bacteria are able to create and the ways that these compounds are able to influence and regulate different aspects of your physiology and your biology. So it's a really, truly a new frontier. And uh, at this point, the last um, scientific documentation I had on postbiotic metabolites, there have been over 22,000 of them that have been recognized and categorized. But um, I just have some major categories like the short chain fatty acids and the antimicrobial tabulite, metabolites and the anti-inflammatory compounds and the immune system and antiviral compounds and so forth. But it's an exciting new area of science because and the other thing that this new area of science is emphasizing is that we are a super organism. We are not just us. We are us plus them. And we have to have a greater appreciation for how important our microbiome is, and we have to learn how to feed it well in order to have it thrive and survive. And so I encourage people to think every time you eat, you're hosting a huge party with a hundred trillion guests. You have to, you are primarily eating to feed them, not so much just yourself. And we think that we humans are so special and that we're controlled by our 23,000 genes. Well, the common rice plant has got 45,000 genes. And so scientists are scratching their heads saying, how can we be as evolved and special as we think we are if we've got 23,000 genes, but the simple rice plant's got 45,000 genes. <laughs> and so this is called the, um, let's see, the genetic conundrum. And what they found out is the reason we don't have to have so many genes or we can get by with fewer genes is that our probiotic bacteria have 3.3 million different genes. And they are doing so much with their genetic blueprint that we can get by with much less. And so it is really us plus them that is our health and our life. And so it just gives us a big, better appreciation for how important our bacteria are. And I encourage everybody to spend more time thinking about how many different types of high fiber foods have you fed your microbiome today? Don't just eat one type of big helping of peas or big helping of carrots. Have keys and carrots and celery and broccoli and a wide range of different types of fiber. And your listeners can go and do a Google search to see my eight minute YouTube video. Just Google Ross Salad Buzz, B-U-Z-Z on YouTube. My eight minute video teaches people how to make a diverse fiber salad in a very limited amount of time. Just give you a quick overview here. Um, I process all my different types of vegetables, about 14 different types of multicolored vegetables at one time, it takes me about 20, 30 minutes and chop them all up. <clears throat> the secret in, is to squeeze a lemon over them and mix it up. The lemon juice has vitamin C, which preserves your salad buzz. And so it stores in a Tupperware for about a week. So five days a week or so, our main meal for my wife and myself is our salad. And I go to the refrigerator and I pull out a bag of mixed greens and I pull out my salad buzz and put a handful on there. And I put a little wild caught salmon or some other source of protein. It takes like two minutes to make supper. It's such a time saving mechanism. And you immediately get a very diverse um, fiber rich salad that's got like 10, 12, 14 different types of fiber in it. So again, yeah. people can view that YouTube video by just searching YouTube, Ross Salad Buzz, B-U-Z-Z. -Z. And just to clarify, we're not talking about eating fiber bars and things that say multi-grain as the fiber that you need, or, and Twinkies do not qualify either. 
Yeah, <laughs> you're right. And that brings up a good point. And I think appreciate you mentioning this because a lot of people are taking inulin or fructooligosaccharides, or these are good types of fiber. But when you take high amounts of fiber, it's just like taking mega doses of probiotics. You're not promoting balance and diversity. So you should get a wide range of different types of fiber from the foods that you eat. And I promote, you know, a lot of people ask me, what's the healthy diet? Food without labels. Love, love, love that. I think about that. A bell pepper and a carrot and broccoli and spinach don't have a label on them listing all sorts of different ingredients. So um, the majority of your food should be fresh, organically grown, non-GMO foods that have no labels on them. Love that so much because it's so clean and pure, just food without labels, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. just says it all. Change their health very quickly by switching to a whole food, diverse type of fiber, natural food diet, because within several days, you'll change your microbiome and you'll start getting these postbiotic metabolites that will have all of these regulating effects to improve the health of your microbiome and your gut brain communication and everything else. Well, let's leap into that for a second. So why is the gut the second brain? The gut is the second brain because it has an enormous amount of neurons. It's like there's billions of neurons in your brain, there's billions of neurons in your gut, and the gut communicates directly with the brain. And it's the main route of communication between the gut and the brain is called the vagus nerve. It's the longest nerve in your body. It goes from your brain stem all the way down through the, your lower back and connects with all your organs. And what's really interesting is scientists have discovered that about 20% of the information traveling up and down the vagus nerve is information from your brain to a, your gut. But that means 80% of the information on the vagus superhighway is information that your gut is sending to your brain. Your gut is in constant communication with your brain and regulating a lot of what goes on in your brain. We now understand that food choices are in, to some degree, dictated by your microbiome. If you eat junk food and get a microbiome that is preferring high fat, high sugar foods, they're gonna crave that and they're gonna tell your brain, I want more of that junk food. Like yeast? It takes discipline, it takes discipline to switch over to a healthy diet because you're breaking a, a line of communication where the bad bacteria are trying to control what you eat and get what they want. Yeah, uh, and then you're sabotaging yourself 100%. Really? Absolutely. And 50% and of the dopamine and 90% of the serotonin made in your body is made in your gut. We yeah, oh yeah, neurotransmitters. Brain, brain neurotransmitters, but they're really made in your gut. And if you have dysbiosis and an upset microbiome, all that neuro, those neurotransmitters are being dysregulated. And so people get depression and anxiety. And that's not this whole part of the equation, but that's part of it. It's a really significant part of it. Now, how would somebody know if they have dysbiosis? Well, the common symptoms are gas and bloating and, and diarrhea and, and discomfort, inflammation in the gut. Um, like bloating, so are, like where they're just really distended? Yeah. Yep, big, yep, bloating is a big one. Um, and so those are the gas. There are other symptoms in the GI tract that could be not related to dysbiosis. I mean, there's things like colon cancer and, and right. you know, so forth. But the major symptoms, gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, inflammation, pain, and discomfort, those are all related to the microbiome. And a healthy microbiome should have about 85, this is roughly, about 85% good bacteria and only maybe 10 or 15% bad bacteria. We've all got some bad bacteria, but when things are in balance so that it's predominantly the healthy bacteria and only a few of the bad bacteria, the bad bacteria aren't going to make any difference because they can't get a big enough stronghold to produce uh, bad things that will be toxic to you. And actually bad bacteria make postbiotic metabolites also. That's where the toxins come from. But if things are in balance and you have predominantly good bacteria, then the small numbers of back, bad bacteria don't make any big difference in, your, in a healthy microbiome and a healthy body. 
Now, is there a way for us to measure what we actually have in our gut? You can do um, stool analysis, which will look at the uh, uh, metabolites and the uh, bacteria in your stool, but we still aren't really able to do too good a job of getting into the different areas in the small intestine. And we're finding out that all the way through the digestive tract, through the small intestine and into the transverse and ascending and descending colon, there's different populations of bacteria that live in all those different sites. And as we travel down the gastrointestinal tract from the stomach, which has a higher oxygen content, down into the small intestine and the large intestine, the level of oxygen goes down and down and down so that in the colon, it's an anaerobic environment that has less than 1% oxygen. And the colon is where over 99% of your probiotic bacteria live and they are anaerobic. They require a non-oxygen environment. And so also the pH is important, the acid base level. And the acid base level in the colon is just slightly acidic, about 5.6 to 5.9. Seven is neutral. You go higher than seven, you get into alkalinity, and lower than seven gets into acidity. So a healthy microbiome has just a slightly acidic pH, and that's because postbiotic metabolites like short-chain fatty acids and nucleic acids and organic acids and fulvic acids, these all these postbiotic metabolites have slightly acidic pHs, which keeps the acid base balance in the colon at the slightly acidic acid base balance, which is optimal for the growth of the good bacteria and suppresses the growth of bad bacteria. But when people have dysbiosis, the acid base in the colon can be anywhere from 10 to 100 times too alkaline. You got to get it back down to that slightly acidic level to be a healthy environment to promote the growth of your good bacteria. And then if you directly ingest these postbiotic metabolites, you can turn that around very, very quickly. That's why Dr. Hirsch probiotics get what we call rapid microbiome repair or rapid microbiome restoration because you're directly delivering these postbiotic metabolites. Does taking your pH give you any clue as far as whether you're, you know, creating not a good really environment? Most people check their pH or doing a salivary pH. That's not telling you the pH in your. Oh, okay, that's what I figured. So how do we know if? Because I know I've heard this before that our probiotics are actually getting where they need to go. Well, that's a good question. And um, again, you can do a, a comprehensive digestive stool analysis where you send in a stool sample and they can evaluate the types of bacteria in your stool, in your, your large intestine, in your colon. And they can also identify if you have undigested fibers. And if you have undigested fibers, that means your bacteria aren't doing the job they're supposed to do, which means you don't have the right type of bacteria. You don't have the right kinds of bacteria. And so comprehensive digestive stool analysis is a good way to do this. There's also um, like 23andMe and, and some of these other companies are now doing analysis of the um, DNA in your microbiome. Oh, wow. So that's that's super the whole cool. area that's starting to increase in, in terms of testing. So w would you recommend, I, I had a colonic and the lady said I was good because she could watch, you know, through the, you know, to see the way it's all and whether you're cleaned out and, you know, yeah, and to be mild. A couple, <laughs> couple of comments on that about colonics and colonoscopies. When you do, I'm not really a big fan of, of colonics because you're flushing everything out. You're flushing out, out good and bad bacteria. My healthy microbiome. I wondered I about flush that. Them all out. And there's good studies that show that after a colostomy, excuse me, a colonoscopy. Oh, okay. After a colonoscopy, comparing, divide people into two groups. One group get a placebo, the other group get probiotics. The people that get probiotics have far fewer symptoms and problems following their colonoscopy. And there's another study where people took probiotic prior to having a colonoscopy, and they did much better afterwards than people that didn't take any probiotics. So taking probiotics either before or directly after a colonoscopy will rebuild the microbiome, 
and help to really minimize the discomfort that a lot of people experience after a colonoscopy. So I'm not in, I'm encouraging people not to get their colonoscopy. That's a really important early warning symptom of colon cancer. People should evaluate that, but take some steps to fortify your microbiome before and after to, because you want to always try to create and maintain a healthy microbiome. It is so central to your health. And so, so important. And, and equally, not taking products that, you know, uh, I guess that cause you to eliminate and really strip you because yeah. you, you want something that isn't going to strip you of all your good bacteria. Absolutely. And in fact, um, I mentioned that I'm the author of the Drug Induced Nutrient Depletion Handbook. I've created a new class of drugs called Microbiome Disrupting Drugs. And um, my books are out of print, but I've got a quick reference guide to drug-induced nutrient depletions. And I'll send that link to you so you can share it with all of your viewers and people can get a free copy of my quick reference guide to drug-induced nutrient depletions. But things like, uh, we know that anti excuse, anti antibiotics se severely disrupt the microbiome. Right. But also things like antacids, proton pump inhibitors, and the, the H2 blockers, and just Tums and things like that, they change, the, they suppress acid, and then that changes the pH in the whole digestive system, and you end up with gut problems. Um, birth control pills and hormone replacement pills upset the microbiome. There's a wide range of drugs. I think I got 12 different classes of drugs that upset the microbiome. So people need to be aware of this. So if they're taking some of those drugs, they can take extra steps to really um, okay. focus on. So what about um, bioidentical hormones? Is, is bioidentical that going to disrupt? Hormones are fine. I'm, I'm a big supporter of bioidentical hormones. Okay. Usually you put those on topically on your skin yeah. or intervaginally for, yeah. for women. Um, and, but they're not disrupting the microbiome. Okay. They're not going directly okay. into the stomach. Good to know now, because I have a lot of women in menopause now listening yeah. to this. Um, Wow, so fascinating. And you know, I found it really, I was reading a study that was so fascinating because it was like twins and they had, they actually ate very differently and one was very thin and one was a little bit overweight and their microbiome was different. And so explain this phenomenon as far as, you know, so, so the listeners can understand that it can help so much with weight loss. You bet, you bet. Uh, I have slides on this study and I reported in my seminars. The study is called the discordant twin study. In some sets of identical twins, one twin will remain lean and the other one becomes obese during their lifetime. They've got the same genetics, but they end up with different lifestyles. One of them is exercising, the other is sedentary, and one of them is eating healthy foods, and the other is eating processed foods and so forth. So scientists, took a group of mice and they took the fecal samples from the lean twin and the fat twin. And they put these fecal samples, which are the microbiome of the, the two twins into mice. And the mice that got the microbiome from the lean twin stay lean, but the mice that get the microbiome from the obese twin put on weight very quickly and become obese. Wow, just that's from just the like microbiome. fascinating. The microbiome really regulates how you digest your food and the energy you get from your food. And so that's the link between obesity and your microbiome. And so guess if you aren't convinced yet, <laughs> I mean, there's just so much science. And you know what else I really recognize while taking my, my Dr. O'Hara's uh, it really helps me recover from hard workouts because it kind of dispels that lactic acid that I would normally have. The buildup in your muscle tissues, yes. In fact, there's a couple of studies with Dr. Ruhiras that, that I'll share, just you kind of trigger this in my mind. Everybody would like to have more energy. So there was a study done in Japan with Dr. Ruhiras with mice, and it's called a forced swimming test to exhaustion. So one, they took mice and divide them into two groups. One group of mice got Dr. O'Hara's and the other group of mice got sterile water injected. So they're both getting an injection into, or in lavage into their stomach. The, and they, and I also, I put, I started putting on these slides at the bottom, 
the mice are humanely rescued. We don't allow them to drown. Yeah, I was starting to worry about <laughs> the mice. That, was, is, <laughs> that were killing these mice. So, uh, <laughs> My mind was but definitely going there. <laughs> the mice that got Dr. Rahiris for four weeks swam two times longer before exhaustion compared to the control mice. Tremendous more That's energy. That's great right. for our energy. And then there was another study done with men, and this is a human doing. clinical trial, men on a university track team. And they took Dr. Hears for four weeks and they tested them before taking Dr. Hears. And then again, after they gained an 8.4% increase in hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is what delivers oxygen to your muscles. So you have more power, you're able to use your muscles. In fact, illegal doping in sports is people, athletes take these drugs that increase their hemoglobin. That's illegal. Dr. Hears is legal. It's a legal way of boosting your hemoglobin levels. It also significantly um, increased what's called the lactate level, which means it increased the clearance of lactate. So you have longer time to exercise before you get that lactate build up in your muscles and you get pain and you can't go any farther. Also increased um, oxygen consumption and uh, cardiac output. So significant benefits by in these male track stars and um, athletes on a track team from taking Dr. O'Hara's. So it's really, really significant. And I did CrossFit for years. And I, one of my CrossFit buddies was a really strong competitor. He actually did compete in some of the national meets. And we did a study with him and I did his blood work repeatedly before he started Dr. O'Hara's and then put him on Dr. O'Hara's. And at the end of four weeks, he had about a 4% increase in his hemoglobin level. So wow, that is really is significant. By yes, by optimizing your microbiome, you will get more energy and more nutrients and better nutrient absorption. So all that really helps. We have a bone density study with Dr. Hears probiotics where men and women got increased bone mineral density and increased bone mineral content after taking Dr. Hears for a period of time. And my theory on how we could get an improvement in bone density is that the probiotic bacteria from Dr. O'Hara has created a more optimal microbiome environment. And so when you have that optimal acid-base balance, you do a better job of absorbing things like iron and B12 and potassium and magnesium. And so these are minerals that influence your energy level. And so Dr. O'Hara has improved the absorption of these minerals, vitamins and minerals that increase energy supply over time. Well, and I, I think it's super cool that they have, that they've, you know, he created it way back when, but that they, all the newer science points to what you actually created with having the, the probiotic, the prebiotic, the metabolites, all this, um, you know, it's such a good product. And I love that you don't have to refrigerate it. Yeah, that's another good point. Um, it, the fermentation process is done in a, a warehouse. And so the bacteria over a period of years are learning to thrive and survive at room temperatures. So you're right, it does not have to be refrigerated. And you don't have to worry about full stomach or empty stomach. The capsule is a patented capsule design that stays hard in the harsh acid environment in your stomach. And then it becomes porous and selectively releases the contents in the small intestine. And so you can eat it anytime or take it anytime. And a lot of dentists are now recommending that at bedtime, people bite and chew a Dr. Hears capsule and squeeze the contents out of your mouth and swish it around for about 30 seconds to improve your oral microbiome. And it helps to reduce um, gingivitis and all, all those types of- I do that a lot with the, with yeah. the, cause it I- It doesn't taste bad at all. <laughs> I was on the cruise to lose with Anne Louise Gittleman and, um, I think one of the Dr. O'Hara reps was there and they were telling us to do that with the, with the capsule, with the doctor, pro, you know, the probiotic. And I literally have been doing that ever since. And so, yeah, so I, I, I really feel like I, I still have really great teeth because I'm not getting all these cavities and all this decay. So my husband told me, oh, I use xylitol and gum. I'm like, no, no, that runs your digestion. If you're chewing too much gum, you need to do the Dr. O'Hara's because it's going to help get rid of all that bad bacteria in your mouth. Here's a little history on Dr. O'Hara that kind of ties into just what we're talking about. 
Dr. Hira, in his original first career, was a very successful landscape architect. He had developed an international reputation, and he got invited by the country of Malaysia to go and create uh, the architectural design for a large park in one of the major cities. He did that in 1976. In 1980, he went back to the grand opening ceremonies, and he happened to eat some tainted food and got violently ill. There was a shaman, this is just synchronicity, there was a shaman attending these grand opening ceremonies. He saw Dr. Hare in enormous distress. He kind of spoon fed him this black syrupy little pasty stuff. It instantly cured him. And so he's a curious guy. He got some samples of this and he took it back to Japan and played around with it and tested it. He had learned that it was created by fermenting locally grown Malaysian fruits and vegetables. After a while in testing this, he got frustrated because he didn't have the scientific background to really learn how it worked and why it worked. So at age 49, he went back to the university and got a PhD in microbiology. And that's how this whole process started. So if he hadn't been invited to Malaysia, and if he hadn't gone to the grand opening ceremonies, and if he hadn't eaten bad food, and if there hadn't been a shaman there, <laughs> none of this would have happened. And now we've got this incredible product that's helping millions and millions of people worldwide. And, uh, but that's how Dr. O'Hara got onto the idea of this fermentation process to produce Dr. O'Hara's probiotics. I love and by the way, I've so did my, my, most, my most recent book that I've just finished is on Dr. O'Hara and Dr. O'Hara's probiotics. And we're just uh, finished the final editing and it will be available soon. I'll notify you so that you can notify all your followers that we'll have a, a book about this whole uh, Dr. O'Hara who's it's a visionary. A story. Scientist. Yeah. Now, just again for the listeners so they can really understand because we, we talked about the metabolites, we talked about a lot of things. What do we need to make sure we have a complete microbiome system so all everything's operating together to work for the yeah. greater good <laughs> the only way you can do that is to consume a diverse range of fibers yes it's good to take probiotics but they've got to have the fibers in order to create the postbiotic metabolites to get the health benefits that regulate your health so the real secret to a healthy microbiome is a diverse range of fiber rich foods and to stay away from processed foods. Um, stay away from foods with labels. And um, it's beef is good if it's grass fed and grass finished and fish is good if it's wild caught. You know, you gotta eat healthy fats, healthy proteins, healthy carbohydrates, non-processed foods. And, but I, I think that people need to pay more attention to creating and maintaining a healthy microbiome. You, they can take probiotics, different types of commercial probiotics, but Dr. O'Hara's will directly deliver the postbiotic metabolites. And Dr. O'Hara's contains probiotic bacteria, prebiotic fibers, and most importantly, over 500 of the postbiotic metabolites. But it's, it's diet and lifestyle. I mean, you need to get healthy sleep and you need to get regular exercise and you have to eat healthy food, learn how to avoid environmental toxins, stay away from things like glyphosate and organophosphates and all these agricultural pesticides and insecticides. You have to eat organically grown food. Um, it takes work to be healthy these days. For millions of years, people survived and the environment was healthy. It's not healthy anymore. You have to be proactive. So that's kind of a little summary. Well, yeah, you definitely have to be pro proactive all yeah. the way <laughs> and read and do your homework and do your research and listen to experts like you, Dr. Ross, that really know their stuff so you can understand what you're actually doing and why you're yeah. doing it. Yeah, exactly. and Can a person get too much probiotics? Yes, you can put things out of balance. You can take massive doses. In fact, I've got a couple of studies that document this, and I've got the references on my slides, where you can take too much of a type of probiotic of one or several strains and get things out of balance. And then you can have some problems because your immune system, even they're, if they're good bacteria, you take too many of them, and your, back, your immune system says, wait a minute, this is way out of balance. And so you go into an immune system alarm reaction and start to have problems. I use the analogy of immigration. Our country, before all the problems currently, but, but we've always allowed immigrants to come into our country. But if all of a sudden we got 100 million immigrants coming in, 
everything would break down. We wouldn't have school system, fire department, police departments, and educational systems that could handle massive amounts of good people coming in. It's the same thing with your probiotic bacteria. It's not quantity of one or two types of bacteria. It's a range of diverse strains of bacteria. So multi-strain probiotics are better, but most importantly is consuming a diverse range of fibers so that the bacteria can do their work and create this diverse range of postbiotic metabolites. Now, I knew somebody that had SIBO, so they had it all kind of, they had taken too many and it was kind of clustered in the gut. Yep. Um, so, wow. I mean, SIBO is a little bit of a different situation. Okay. It's where bacteria that normally reside in the colon have backed up and they're now living in oh, okay. the small intestine. So that's why it's called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And about 50% of people, roughly what I've found over time, about 50% of people can go on the FODMAP diet or there's a carbohydrate diet that, and they teach you to eliminate a lot of different foods that will starve these bacteria that are living in the wrong environment. But for the 50% of people that can't do one of those therapeutic diets, or, or they're not successful with it, yeah. they have to take antibiotics to wipe out all the bacteria and then rebuild a healthy start microbiome. Over. But they also have to make lifestyle changes because a dehydration, a lack of water can allow this to happen. So a lack too. of exercise can have, make this happen and bad foods can make yeah. this happen. So you've got to make lifestyle changes in order to not have SIBO reoccur. Yes, and you've got, you're, you preach into the choir today. I wrote like a pitch for the, for a, for a show and it was all about detoxifying the body. And, it, and one of the greatest ways is what you just said is drinking water yeah. and, and for your digestion too. There's a fascinating new bit of information about water too that I'm just so excited about. Um, there's a fourth state of water. We think about water as being gas, liquid, or solid. Ice, liquid water, or steam and, and gas. There's a fourth state of water that nobody generally talks about. And, and it's, the example they use to explain it is when you make jello. Jello is a, a bunch of powdered protein and collagen and so forth. You put hot water in there and you make jello. But once you've made jello, if you stick your finger in it, water doesn't run out. The water is binding with the proteins. And that's what happens in every cell in your body. If you stick a needle in a cell, water doesn't squirt out. And yet the majority of our body is water, but it's water yes. that's bound with the proteins. And this is the fourth state of water. And when, um, People get sick and they do all the wrong types of things in their bodies. The water starts to change its state and has a different way of binding and you don't hold the proteins in the right, in the correct position and everything becomes dysfunctional. Now, the, the, this new line of scientific inquiry is saying that it's not so much your genes that regulate your health, but it's how water binds all the proteins in your cells. And that allows your genes and the mitochondria to function correctly. But um, after we get off the air, I'll send you a link to this and, and we can talk about this as a fascinating uh, story. That is very interesting. <laughs> I love learning all the information and listening to the studies. I totally geek out on any kind of science. <laughs> I could pull the book off my bookcase right now and show it, but I'll just tell you that there's a new book called Cancer and the New Biology of Water. It's a fascinating book. I'll send you the link so you can post it if people are interested in it. But it, it talks Perfect. about all of your biology and how it works and why it doesn't work when you have cancer and how this new biology of water kind of ties into it all. I love it. This has been such a great episode with you today. I love it. Every time I have you on, I'm learning new things and new reasons why it's important to stay diligent with my probiotics. I, I mean, I, I guarantee you I'm going to be reaching for them as soon as 
get off here. It's a thrill to talk with you again. And I'll send you after the show the link to my um, Townsend letter, Doctor Postbiotic Metabolites, the New Frontier in Microbiome Science, so that your viewers can get that article for free. And I'll send you the link to my quick reference guide to drug induced nutrient depletion so people can have that for free. Perfect. That has been so great today. I just want to acknowledge you so much for being a pioneer in the industry of being, you know, a pharmacist, but changing over to the natural pharmacist. To me, that is just worth its weight in gold. So I just want to thank you for that. And I want to ask you, what are your three simple tips for the audience before we go to maintain their health? Eat healthy is number one. Exercise regularly is number two. Probably healthy sleep is number three, but oh, eating yeah, that's, well that's is important. going to give you a healthy microbiome. So that all ties in. But you, yeah. you've got to exercise and get movement also. In fact, I've published a couple of articles I can send you links about that say your microbiome love to exercise. When people exercise, it'll change your microbiome. And oh, so it's perfect, all, perfect. It's all tied in, yeah. And sleep gets rid of your toxins too, so Absolutely. it's pretty in important. Fact, have you heard of the, you know about the lymphatic system? Have you heard of the glymphatic system? The glymphatic system is the lymphatic system in the brain. And they've now discovered in, in mice studies that when you sleep, your brain cells shrink by 40%. And that opens up the channels that allow to detoxify your brain. During your waking hours, your brain cells are active all the time and that metabolism in your brain cells is creating toxins. When you sleep, the brain cells shrink, which increases the size of all the lymphatic channels in the brain that flush out the toxins. And that's called the glymphatic system where the G is in George. And so that's one of the reasons why sleep is so critically important because you're detoxifying your brain during sleep. And it also helps to keep you from getting Alzheimer's if you sleep, sure, and, you sure. know, the correct amount of time. And another topic that I'm really passionate about is pulsed electromagnetic frequencies, which ties in with all of this body health stuff. And if you're interested in your viewers are interested, you can do a, a whole section on or session on that sometime. Yeah, maybe we'll do, we'll do a couple different topics yeah. when you come back. It's always a pleasure. And as always, <laughs> keep on keeping on everybody out there and let us know how much you enjoyed this episode you might decide you want to go uh, take your probiotics and adopt some mice today no i'm just kidding but um just let us know so we know what to share with you next time thanks everyone and thanks dr ross all right take care Bye bye, bye.